Colorado, Captain Rhodes from Day of the Dead, hanging out here on the movie raid. And if you're not hanging out with me on the movie raid, I know where you live, I know where to find you, and I'll shoot you, you puss fuck, right between the eyes. So, turn to the movie raid. It's time for the movie raid, and tonight's victim is actor Joe Pilato that played in George Romero's Day of the Dead and Wishmaster, amongst many others. What's up, Joe? And Dawn of the Dead. And Dawn of the Dead. You puss fuck, you know. All you fuss fucks better be putting your ears real close to uh, whatever you're looking at or put your eyeballs real close to whatever you're eating at because if you don't, I know where to find you. And one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to fuck around with Captain Rose. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right, well, I'm in somewhere deep in a bunker in Los Angeles, California. There you go. First question is uh, from Vic Mendoza, and this... Hey, Dick or Vic? Vic Mendoza. Hey, Vic. How are you, man? <laughs> and he asks, are you still lonely in the cave? Vic, I am so lonely that if you were a true friend, if you were a true zombophile, if you were a true road uh, platoon member, you would be sending me barrels of women. I don't care if this arms, leg, uh, torso, torsos are, are always work. Head, uh, thigh pieces. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm lonely, and I think that uh, I think that the, the troops out there should be sending me a care pack. That's right. It's been a long time. It's too long, man. <laughs> so what's been going on? You got a new film coming up soon. Yeah, well, I just finished uh, as a Night of the Living Dead Origin, uh, and that's a total CG production. That's where they put the, the helmet on your head and uh, put that camera right up to your eyeballs. And, and it's a retelling uh, uh the basic uh, retelling of uh, George's story, uh, because as, as everybody knows, uh, poor George uh, lost uh, the ability to get paid because his story went into the public domain. So anybody can make uh, a story called Night of the Living Dead, and as you know, many people already have. Uh, and this is a new take on it. It's a new spin on it. It's a uh, Directed by a man named Zebediah DeSoto, and it takes place in present day New York City. So you've got that old Gotham quality uh, going on with it. And uh, I play Harry Cooper, who this time, uh, as opposed to being Captain Rose, Harry Cooper, as we know, is very victimized because he's got his bitten daughter. Only in this version, instead of Harry Cooper wanting to keep the daughter in the cellar. Uh, they're in a townhouse in uh, in New York City, and Harry Cooper wants to keep his uh, bitten daughter uh, up on the roof. And we got Tony Todd uh, is 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 with us, and it's a good it's good good strong good strong crew and. Zebediah, the director, stayed very, very, very extremely close to George's story, which is nice because said it because you can't really argue too much with George's story. It's so perfect. So that setting George's story up against the backdrop of New York City, it just makes for a, a really, really exciting uh, project. Plus the uh, the CG images are spectacular, and uh, that should be out soon. It's by the people, uh, Simon West Productions, same people that did Black Hawk Down, and uh, we're just looking forward to them out. So why why is New York, per se, is it, is it actually going to be more action-packed? Is it actually going to be scary? Yeah, I think, uh, I think what Zeb was thinking was, you know, night is usually played in in some kind of small rural uh, environment, and I think that uh, I think that he wanted that in terms of the 
apocalyptic vision. He wanted, you know, he wanted those Times Square shots. He wanted the, the Empire Empire building in the background, that hustle bustle, the yellow cab screaming uh, all over the city. I think that's uh, that that's what he was after, and uh, that's that's what he got. You know, dealing with the subways, and, uh, so it's not rural country. It's actually you know very very heavily fortified uh, city scene. But this time, you know, you can run down, hopefully make it to the local gas station, buy some cigarettes, and if you get caught, uh, you know, pick up the gas tank and uh, take a whack at the zombies. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it was. It's kind of a. It's kind of an uh, uh, interesting, interesting twist on the thing. Even though it's the same story, but it's actually going to be a little bit more different. Is actually, you think it's actually going to be a little bit more better or further more enhanced as far as the experience goes? Well, you know, I'm I, I'm, I'm reluctant to to use the word better where George George's story is involved because I don't think anybody can can be uh, better than George. Uh, I, I just think that the brilliance of the idea was take George's story and to to take it out of a rural setting and to to put it uh, put it in that busy busy high metropolitan uh, I mean if we look at New York uh, as as sort of I mean even the terrorists when you think about it they, they look as at, at New York as the completely representative place uh, of the United States government, and uh, so I think that that's uh, that's where the Zeb wanted to keep it, and it's uh, it's a little bit different to see how a uh, metropolitan city uh, pulls all their resources together as opposed to a small kind of rural you know situation uh, you know uh, out in the boonies somewhere. Hmm. But you know you got a lot of tanks streets and uh, National Guard mobilized people uh, all over the place. So it's, yeah, it's kind of fun. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of uh, potential in it for a lot more gunfire and a lot more action. What's your take on with this character? I mean, this is a pretty big character, even for the early days of George Romero. And then you also got Tom Savini's version, which is was also good, too. Oh, Tom's was great. As I said, there's, uh, it's like, you know, we all read the Grimm's fairy tales when we were kids. Uh, those stories, you could tell Cinderella, or you could tell, uh, Goldilocks, or, uh, you could tell, you could tell a fairy tale 25, 35 different ways. And that's, uh, that's the beauty of, uh, of George's story. Uh, I like Tom's. Version. Uh, the interesting thing about Tom's version is that, and this is you know how so how far the technology has come. But the interesting thing about uh, Tom's version is that we brought uh, we brought color to the story, which the, of course the original being shot in such uh, static black and white. Yeah, that adds adds an incredible amount. Uh, to the horror of the thing, but uh, yeah, I, I like Tom's version a lot. I like it very much. Yeah, I mean, if you were to compare the first film of, the, of George Romero's film and then Tom Savini's, it's like you look at Tom Savini's. It's like it enhances between characters from George's version. Like for example, Barbara. I mean, she did nothing on George Romero's version, but and then Tom Savini's version, she's kicking ass. Right, and that's uh, I know I know both actors really well uh, Judith O'Day and, and Patricia Tallman uh, Patricia's a stunt woman mm -hmm. uh, by, by trade and uh, Judith is a very classically trained uh, actress and you know I have to say that I like I like them both uh, I like uh, I like in, in Judith's version I like her passivity because when she does become active, we realize what a big, difficult stretch it is for her to to, to achieve. Now, in Patty's, uh, or Patricia Tallman's uh, Barbara, because it doesn't matter, they're still always coming to get you, Barbara. 
No. Oh, in Patricia's uh, interpretation of Barbara, she's a very physical, hands-on woman, and she's dazed, used for a little bit, but then what you get to see is when that anger surges up in her, it's not, as in Judith's character, it's not an anger surging up in somebody that's not attuned to that anger, which is a whole different story, but in, in Patricia's, it's the anger in a person who is used to dealing with it. So, Patty's got the short haircut and the tank top shirt on, and uh, Judith has, you know, the primpy hair and the raincoat uh, happening. So, the, so, they're very, you know, they're two... They're similar, but they're very different at the same time. The old version... Um, she's so petrified she can't believe what's going on and no one's ever seen this type of situation in, in anyone's life that, 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 and, and she plays it wonderfully from, oh yeah from the time our dear friend who is now in heaven uh, Bill Heinzman uh, in the uh, in the original the, the cemetery zombie who passed away this year it was a oh. great loss to uh, all of us we'll miss him dearly and deeply but uh, yes Judith is I mean, she's almost uh, catatonic for the first uh, 15 minutes. I mean, even when she's trying to get away in the car and crawling through the woods and fight, she's still until until Dwayne, you know, I, I, kind of slaps her ac- across the face and, and says, hey, look. And she wakes up where is Patty is. She's more a survivalist, um, and she's kind of digging dig it in right from the beginning. That, that's an interesting question to pull the fan, pull your uh, fan base with and see, uh, ask them either which Barbara they would want to be. Or, yeah, I mean, it's or, like with or, you, <laughs> which Harry Cooper are you going to be? I mean, you really got to put that out there. I, I mean, it's such so it, my, it's my, classic. My, the Harry Cooper in the original, when you think about it, and, and actually there's a weird story that because uh, Tyra Schoen, who plays the little girl in the original uh, Night of the Living Dead, her father, I mean, her real father, mm-hmm. played Harry Cooper. Yeah. Which, and I, I know, I know Kyra, I know Kyra very, very well. We're really good friends. And uh, when I told her that I was I was playing her dad uh, role. She kind of got very emotional and uh, in a nice way. Uh, but uh, for me, it's it's really not that much different because there's nothing really. I hate to use the word nice, but I guess that's the word that I have to use because there is nothing nice about Harry Cooper. Harry Cooper's life in the movie, his movie life, is very well defined. It's either, it's black or white. It's, in the old one, it's the cellar or it's upstairs. And it's, in the new one, it's the top of the townhouse or it's down in the townhouse. Now, when I do conventions, it's funny because I always ask the audience, I say, if you were Harry Cooper and you had a daughter and a wife, and your daughter was ill, and you didn't really know what was wrong with her, because uh, it takes a little while for them to figure out what was wrong with her, and you didn't know what was wrong with her, where would you choose to stay? Would you stay in the cellar or on the roof? And nine times out of ten, that's something you can ask your audience members too. Uh, and it's funny because it's normally the parents who answer, answer the question, and it's uh, nine times out of ten that they would stay in the safe in the safe spot, in the guaranteed safe spot. Following me? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting situation, top or bottom. Right. But, I mean, it's like you look at the Tom Savine's version. Yeah, it clearly can be bad. If you haven't seen Tom Savine's version, I'm not going to ruin it, but um, you know, horror films has been coming for such a long time, and now we're in a new era and you got CGI, you got all all this really cool looking stuff. What what are your thoughts 
on how horror films are now. Do you think it's kind of losing their touch a little bit because they got they got that new feel to it, but there's no scare? Uh, I do not like uh, the CGI process at all. Yeah. For an actor, this is internally, not as an audience member, but for an actor, you, you're always working with a green screen and an imaginative picture. In other words, very, very rarely are you interacting with other actors. Uh, very rarely are you seeing what the director is ultimately going to see on the CG screen. So you're in a vacuum, and you're sort of having to uh, act on a set of imaginary pictures, where in a real situation, even though you know that uh, you've got a lot of special... In other words, the Day of the Dead, uh, as Captain Rhodes, uh, you know, when Bub was chasing me down the hallway before I, I was torn in half, uh, I wasn't on a green screen. I was in a real hallway, and Buff was chasing me down the hallway. and With real pig guts. <laughs> hundreds of zombies around, and I really did get torn in half. I mean, I had to go through that process, that, that hands-on process of the special effect. And I think that that, I think that, that translates to the camera a lot better. You, know, you can do, you can put the White House in your living room in CG effect, and everybody that obviously can't have the White House in somebody's living room, and that it's a CG effect, where, you know, other things that are, are created by hand and by machine, uh, I find to be much more frightening, because they're three-dimensional. They're not, uh, they're not two-dimensional configurations. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's just so, now these days it's the, the films it, there's there's a lot of horror films out there some of them are, are doing really well and then there's a lot of them are just not really making a hit because you got so many haunted type films a haunted house with a demonic spirit or somewhere outside that's a demonic spirit or basically anything that's demonic you that's all they're really doing at this point a horror the 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 genre itself it's actually it's it's back but it's it's kind of like wobbly you know what I mean yeah yeah well Anything, you know, anything that's repeating itself in many ways, like Saw 1, Saw 2, Saw 3, Saw 4, uh, uh, you know, you know that uh, it's sort of a franchise, and they're just trying to make as much money as they can. The thing with George's films, most good, I mean, 28 Days Later, uh, things that grab you, you find really that it's not the special effects that grab you, it's the story that grabs you. And that's what makes the special effects so compelling because they're related to a story. And, uh, you know, that story and driven characters like Captain Rose in Day of the Dead versus uh, the military in Day of the Dead. These are the these are the issues that kind of drive the story. And if you don't have a good story, and if you don't have highly driven characters, then you know all you do is you have one special effect to another special effect, and whatever happens in between is just fluff. I mean, mm. when you think about Lake Placid, what a nice little movie, you know? Yeah. And there's this, these characters develop. Oliver Platt is the weird guy, and, uh, you know, Betty White's the weird little lady. And you got this, and then you got the story. You got the, the, the giant alligator, and you got the special effect. And so when that all comes into play and that all comes together, it makes sense because you got a, a strong and viable story. Yep. I don't know. I don't know what your fans feel about it, but that's what I feel about it. Yeah, it's like with these uh, newer slasher type films, it's just not believable because they're just repeating from the old days. It's just not really cut it now because it looks so fake when they do it. You got blood splurring all over the place that shouldn't be really splurred because the anatomy, for one. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know, make it believable, okay? I mean, look at the original My Bloody Valentine. Right, that's a great film. 
say so. It is. And then you look at Jaws, clearly a classic, always. It scared the hell out of everybody after it first came out because they're so terrified to get in the water. Tex Chainsaw Massacre, the original, they were so terrified because they actually thought there was a real killer named Leatherface. Yeah. Uh, but now it seems what you have is, is you have blood, blood for blood sake, and no. uh, that, that's not what it was. I mean, when you look at the classic universal horror movies, Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, you very, very, you hardly ever, ever see any blood. Yeah. You know? And sometimes you don't need blood at all. I mean, it just sells I, itself. I mean, the, ec- or not Exorcist, but I mean, the Poltergeist had absolutely right. no real gore in it. Right, right. Well, if you look at the original, the thing from another, uh, the creature from another planet, the mm-hmm. Howard Hawks version of the thing. Yeah, you know, you see, you see the monster if you're lucky for 20 seconds, uh, the entire the entire film. So yeah, it's but I mean this tends to happen and it's a cyclical thing. But then you've got you've got that picture uh, sign Mel Gibson where the farm uh, they, they got these uh, the crops are being cut and they don't know who or why the crops are being cut into certain patterns or shape. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and it's very... Uh, or look at the success of Contagion, which, you know, is really not a monster, but it is kind of a sci-fi movie. Uh, you know, you never see what's killing people, ever. Yeah. And it, it you know, it makes the, it makes the, the hair uh, on the back of your neck bristle. Yeah. Do you think the film industry... It's more focused on the product and quantity? Well, you know, unfortunately, when we speak of the film industry versus uh, particular artists, uh, the film industry, uh, here's the best way I can, uh, Fox, Fox News is totally right wing. In other words, everything that they're geared to is to get Romney elected, to get Romney elected. Now, if Rupert Murdoch, who run Fox News, thought that he could make more money by running stuff that said Obama should get elected, he would do that because he's not interested really in who's getting elected. He's interested in how much money he can make. It's the same thing with the film industry. So if CG brings people to the box office, then that's what they're going to go with. If uh, subtlety and story brings people to the box office, that's what they're going to go to. The problem there, though, is the only problem there is to make a huge, and I'm, I'm going outside the realm of horror for now, I'm going into the realm of uh, action films, to make a big budget action movie today, I mean, budget wise, almost has to go CG. Unfortunately, because I mean, you know, you look at uh, Cecil B. DeMille, Ben Hur, I and mean, that's not, all, all those movies, there was no CG. There, those were thousands and thousands of barbarians running through the mountains uh, in. in Real time, but no studio, no studio is going to take going to take the time or the money to uh, to do that. So we're in a. I think where I think where we are is I think the heroes or the guy the guide are the independent filmmakers, and that and that and in a way, George was always even though traditionally he was not an independent filmmaker, but he was. He always had very low budgets, and he, even though he was repped with studios and things like that, yeah. he was considered the little artist, put him in the corner, here's your money, come back with your picture, and we'll take care of it. We won't give it a huge distribution in the, in the theaters, and it'll eventually go to videotape, or right now, uh, you know, DVD, uh, and it'll sell millions and millions of copies, and your artistry, so they throw, they throw people, uh, they throw people like George a little bone. Yeah. And, and, that, and it's, it, yeah, I mean, 
mean, there are y- y- comedy uh, like Zombie Honeymoon, which is uh, which is not a bad little movie because it's uh, you know it's a comic look at uh, at the genre. Deadheads, have you seen Deadheads? Uh, yeah. Yeah. What did you think? It wasn't too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and oh. did you see the one I was talking about with uh, Mel Gibson signs? Yes. What did you think of that? Uh, I really didn't agree with how the aliens arrived. The whole planet's filled with water, yet they're afraid of water. Uh, you didn't like the way they arrived or were portrayed? Uh, I would say pr- more like portrayed because the fact that not only that, one of them gets beaten by a baseball bat. Um, are, are these intelligent aliens or are they just purely weaklings or the, the, the weaker bunch out of wherever the race they came from? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, you know, again, I, I, I don't know. The thing I liked about it was that the, uh, the sense of suspense. Oh, yeah. Uh, then it's the other one. I can't remember. Uh, he's a really good actor. He's actually acting in, uh, he's actually acting in uh, Boardwalk. Uh, where the guy lives in a Midwest town and he has a sense that something bad's going to happen. And he starts building a fallout shelter in his backyard. Uh, I can't remember the movie, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, strange, uh, it's a strange little movie. Once again, where you have that sense of suspense, but you just don't it. Yeah, it's so, it's that mystery until the very end, and uh, and you know I think that that's uh, that's the important thing. I just did a I just did a convention in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, where we shot the exteriors for uh, Day of the Dead, that famous scene where the alligator crawls out of the bank, and uh, the people were wonderful, and uh, this issue came up. Uh, very much yeah. uh, about CG, and I actually said to them that I thought that uh, that I thought that uh, Avatar was a highly highly overrated movie. Oh yeah, and they all clapped when I said that. <laughs> you hear me? Yeah, uh, we're gonna wind the time down. But um, speaking of which, do you actually when you do roll, do you actually take part? Of that role uh, into your own life. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, when you do a role and as you're portraying that character, yeah. do you actually take that character's persona into your own life based on your experience? Uh, it, uh, that depends uh, on 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 how on how it's written. If if uh, if I don't, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, if if I don't have any hands-on experience with the character, then I have to do a lot of work to make the character uh, part of it. But if it's something, you know, that I can relate to or that I know a little a little bit about, uh, then not as difficult. But Every role part of their persona. Uh, some actors say in that persona 24 hours a day, I- I'm not that kind of an actor. <laughs> you know, when I show up on the set, I show up as me, and then when it's time to act, I'm the pilot. One way is better than the other. Yeah. I couldn't have been Captain Rhodes 24 hours a day. People would have shot me. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead and uh, plug in your current film again so people can possibly check it out in the future. When, do you, when are we going to expect this to be released? Well, I don't know. I'm hoping sometime in uh, late fall or early next year. As, as these things go, you know, so much of this stuff is up to studios and uh, different people. So I can't tell you for sure, but uh, I'm waiting for it, and I'm sure the fans are waiting for it. And if anybody's going to be in the Virginia Beach area next weekend, I'm going to do the uh, Blood on the Beach convention. That's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at Virginia Beach. Well, there you go.
And that would be Joe Pilato. Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead, R Origins. I, I used to fuck. Shoot him in the head. Shoot him in the head. Yeah.